brought to you by Sparkle Saloon. Professional, affordable, and quality services. beautiful Sunday night we are coming to you live from our Nile Serena studios this is perspective with Josephine Karunji program we're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena the Nile room and tonight we'll be talking about uh, preterm babies and surviving the odds in the studio we have a couple who came along with their son and they're here to share their story of how they went through that period but also we have uh, Dr. Miriam Apio who is a pediatrician she's also joining us on the panel and we have Dr. Halima Naiwombwe who is also a pediatrician we have quite a number of people today uh, we took up all the space for Dr. M uh, Halima so she's sitting with the audience but she'll be coming in as we go along with the show welcome Dr. Miriam please don't feel like you're too far you're right next to us oh, here on the panel uh, welcome Dr. Miriam thank you Welcome Peter and Rina. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome Karen. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, let's say it as it is. Before we get into a concrete discussion on, on, on the challenges of preterm babies and, and all of that, I want to hear your story with Karen okay. right from the beginning. Thank you, Josephine. Um, my name is Rina Kakuru. Karen is our second born. Right now he's five years old, and he was born at 26 weeks. Um, full term is 40 weeks, as you know, and uh, it, it was a normal pregnancy, and then I started feeling pain. I called my husband, who was at work at the time, and uh, you know, he says, maybe you've been doing a bit of too much work, have some rest. So I took some rest, but when I woke up, the pain was instead intensifying. So I called a friend, I called a doctor, and I tell him, well, just come for a checkup. And I rest a little bit more, gathering myself. And by the time I wake up, I'm bleeding. And this is 26 weeks. So we, I call a friend who rushes me to the hospital near where we lived. And the first hospital we got to, the doctor looked at me, said, you're 26 weeks, you're bleeding? That's a miscarriage. So wait for the nurses to clean you and you go home. Um, at that point, my husband had reached and he quickly said, no, let's seek a second opinion. So we drove to another hospital. And when we reached there, I had lost so much blood. My blood pressure had gone so low. And actually, the doctor's focus was saving my life. They said, well, at 26 weeks, we're not so sure the baby is viable. But when they checked, there was a heartbeat. So they said, okay, if the baby is okay, we'll do whatever we can, but our focus right now is to save the mother's life. So we go through the whole process. I keep getting questions, was it a cesarean or did you push? I actually pushed. You pushed at 26 <laughs> weeks? At 26 yeah. weeks, yes. Okay. So well, I, I was within uh, uh, the labor suit at that point in time. So after Before she Before you get to the labor suit, so yes. she called you and you're at work? Yes. And she says, uh, uh huh. Well, she called me the first time and says she's not, she's feeling rather uncomfortable. She's not feeling well. So I asked her to probably have some rest. And I went into a meeting. So coming out of the meeting, I, I have about 10 missed calls from her. And when I call back, that's the time when she tells me that she's on her way to the hospital. So I jump into the car, put double indicators, and just drive all the way through. Uh, I, was at, uh, I was at around Buganda Road, so I drove all the way to Entebbe Road, around past Zana to the clinic where they had gone. So getting there, uh, we, the doctor tells us that, you know, the way I see it, she's lost a baby, so believe God for another baby. So asked us to wait for a doctor to come and then clean her out and the like. So I said, no, I think let's try elsewhere. And the doctors had refused to release her. I said, no, it's, it's on my hands. I will be the one to take care of whatever happens. So they made me sign then, released us. So I actually called uh, someone. I said, you know, I'm just going to drive through I'm not going to stop on any traffic lights. If I'm arrested, so be it, but let's just go as fast as we can. 
So we drove, got to the hospital, but then we got there. Of course, I was so low that they were actually more concerned about her than the baby. So it took about 30 minutes to really normalize the pressure. Then we went into uh, the, the, the labor suit and then in there, uh, she, she pushes and then the baby gave a very faint cry. He gave a very faint cry and that, that's what gave us hope that yeah. there's they, 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 they still life. And then he went quiet. This was the same day? The yes, very same, the same day. day. In, in, in a space of about an hour. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, um, so I deliver and the baby is so small, he was the size of just my three fingers, not my whole hand. This is how big he was. He was tall, a little tall up to about here. Yeah. That's tall? Yes, but he was just the size of my three head. fingers. Yeah. You. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> he was at birth, he was about 900 grams. Wrong. But then he actually went low to 847 mm -hmm. grams. And uh, his hand, his whole hand, was the size of my finger. And so from my finger, pick five fingers. That's how tiny he was. When he gave a faint cry, immediately he, st he stopped breathing and the doctors were trying to resuscitate him. And the doctor was using two fingers like this. <coughs> and he was just pumping and it just looked like he was playing but the doctor fought for my son's life. The doctor pumped and pumped. He was sweating. He was there for like 30 minutes, you yeah, know. Actually about an hour. He was just, yeah. they forgot about me. You know the care you receive after you've given birth. Everyone went to their baby, totally abandoned me. I'm not complaining. He was transparent. You could see his veins. He was very, very tiny. Um, so after they had resuscitated him and put all the necessary tubes and gotten him onto oxygen and the different things, the doctor comes and tells us, you know what, so we thank God this part is done. But here is the story. 26 weeks, this birth weight with all the things we have seen, chances of this boy surviving are less than 20%. And even if he does, he's likely to have complications. Chances that he will have you know, be not able to talk, not able to walk, and all kinds of complications are very high, and the bill will be crazy. That's when we found out that actually our medical insurance doesn't cover him because it covers nine months plus, the medical insurance provider we had at the time. And so they tell us we'll prob you'll probably get a bill of about half a, million. half a million shillings per day. You're likely to be here for close to three months, um, and that's just a hospital bill you're likely to have to do all kinds of scans and have to bring in medicine from different countries, which will cost you a lot, and yet chances of survival are very low. The doctor looked at us straight and said, in my medical opinion, I would suggest we take the boy off oxygen, and you believe God for another one. Now this is the second doctor telling you, this child is not likely to make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the doctor that fought for his life. Yeah. But this is the doctor yeah. that fought for his life. Right, so, right. Yeah. so this is Karen now. Yes. This is Karen and now. You shared with me some pictures of Karen when he was just born. I'm hoping they'll be playing them on the screen even as we continue having this conversation. Yes. So if anyone can do some quick math, 500,000 a day for three months. Yeah, that would probably be about 45 million. 45 million 45, shillings. Yes, 45 million. Oh, that's Karen on the screen now. When he w was that when he was born? When he was in the incubator. That after was after some time, after actually. Some time. Oh, so he'd grown up a, a lot more now. Uh, yes. yes. That, 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 by the time we woke up to, I'll be honest with you, when the doctors kept telling me the baby is not likely to make it, I didn't want pictures. And I just couldn't take any pictures. I, I just wanted to wrap my mind around this, the fact that this happened and it's gone. By the time we woke up to the idea that a baby could actually make it, me, he had faith from day one. I was literally riding on his faith because even when the doctor said we take him off oxygen and we leave God for another, what he said was, you know, God has given him life, God will sustain it. How? I don't know. And they were talking bills. I was thinking, well, they're talking bills, so yeah. I'm not going to give an answer. <laughs> He's going to give an answer to that, but he didn't even hesitate. So we took pictures. These pictures were about two months later when we started doing kangaroo. 
and that, that when he was stable enough is when we started taking some of these pictures. All right, so uh, Dr. Miriam, why were the two doctors quick to say, uh, just count this one off? Um, first of all, perhaps let me start by saying that um, Rena and Peter just shared a story about a very low birth weight baby, less than one kilogram. And if any of you has ever bought a kilo of meat, <laughs> you can imagine how small that baby is. Um, a lot of times, even in the developed world, the chances of survival for those babies is very, very slim because of the challenges that those babies face. At about 600 <coughs> grams, their chances is stated to be about 26%, even in the developed world. But at 800 grams, their chances of survival significantly increases to about 45%. Uh, in our setting, though, I cannot say the same thing, mainly because we have a lot of system-related challenges. We have issues with infrastructure. We have um, issues with uh, knowledge, even from the medical teams itself, on management of such babies. And all these problems eventually make it almost, make the chances of their survival much more slim. Um, at the moment, as I speak, every 1.5 or every one and a half of 10 people can potentially have a premature baby. And uh, premature deaths are responsible for about 31% of neonatal deaths. They are much more significant at the moment than um, <coughs> HIV and than malaria. If you look at uh, the Uganda um, surveys for under five mortality, um, the percentage is at about, let me say every 64, every, we have 64 deaths for every about 1,000 children born. But of these 64 deaths, about um, 27, of the children that die are actually preterm sure. babies. That is yeah. so significant. It is very significant. And I think so much attention has been given to children who are born, for example, with HIV AIDS, and there has been quite a big impact as a result in the reduction of uh, the deaths that occur from these children with the elimination of mother to child transmission. But mm -hmm. I do not think as much, as much um, attention. attention has been given to preterm babies and right. I believe this is one area that if government and um, all stakeholders focused on there would be very very positive results. All right. well, I'll pose the same question to Dr. Halima who is sitting uh, in our audience. We heard from them say they gave them a what 20 percent chance? Yes. Less than 20 percent and then afterwards the same doctors say just write this baby off go and have another baby what are the challenges from the medical side that perhaps we don't see or they didn't see that they were afraid of for this couple well there are quite many but uh, usually what we do is to give the facts about the child is or the patient's prognosis, like the outcome. And then the final decision usually is made by the parents. I wouldn't say it's right for me to say that I'm stopping this treatment, go home and do this. But I think it was right for them to tell them or to, to tell them what to expect just in case something happens. Um, there are a number of challenges like Miriam alluded to we have challenges with infrastructure. That's um, like the equipment we need to use for most of these preterm babies. We lack many of them. Even when we have them, the demands are higher. So uh, sometimes you realize you have a baby who needs extra interventions that are not readily available, or if they are, the manpower is not enough or people are not skilled enough to use them, so we end up with challenges. Then, um, secondly, sometimes you may give false hope to a parent 
like you tell them no don't worry everything will be okay you will go home with your baby alive and then if something goes wrong they will hold you accountable they will ask you what happened you assured us everything will be okay so i don't think it was wrong for them to tell them that you know maybe your baby may not survive i don't think they told them your baby is dying but <laughs> i think they said let's take the baby off oxygen <laughs> <laughs> is it there's, there's a documentary i, I was watching <laughs> and a mother um, was sharing that her baby was born preterm i don't remember how many but how many weeks but then at a certain point um, because the incubator they were sharing was shared by a number of babies yeah. so they kept telling her and others whose babies had been uh, out of the womb for a couple of days take out your baby and give room to another the newborns the freshly born yeah. ones to have a period in the incubator and that's how she ended up losing her child Josephine we saw babies being kept in ziploc bags in ziploc bags yeah. yes ziploc because the incubators were all used up and babies were coming in and they would just get a ziplock put the baby in you know like a cavera with a seal the, the size of a ziplock yes, yes that you that's use that's for frozen food you know <laughs> that's how tiny they would be and they just put them in there and put cotton on the sides to keep them warm and we we just we know how grateful uh, you know how how lucky and blessed we are we have a support group for moms with premature babies and um, they share their experiences and what Dr. Miriam said is absolutely true. We need more infrastructure, we need more skilled laborers out there, but it's a tough journey. It's a, it's a tough journey. Um, yeah. b before you say something, Peter, and I really want to come back to you guys to mm -hmm. share um, the journey after the hospital, okay. but let's take a short break and we'll be right back. you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center Nail Room. Uh, so Rina, you mentioned that the baby was transparent at a point. He's, he's run off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He wasn't comfortable <laughs> in the spotlight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but at least we saw him and we actually have seen how in five years, wow. Yeah, wow. He's, he's absolutely um, perfectly normal. Um, the docs, we, d we had to see two neurosurgeons because um, part of the complications they expected was that he would get hydrocephalus when the heads grow really big because he had water in his brain. So they expected he would have hydrocephalus. They actually were preparing us to go for surgery at um, Kiwa Hospital in Bale for brain surgery. And then there was a mama in his heart no, quite a number of things. Every day there was a new thing, you know, the doctor was highlighting. So we were in hospital for two and a half months. Yeah. We saw two neurosurgeons. We had to do an MRI scan. Miraculously, though, none of the complications actually came to pass. So eventually when they did the scan, the head circumference was normal. There was no water in his brain. The mama in his heart, it, the, what, the issue closed and he hit all his milestones on time. He walked on time, he sat on time. He is perfectly normal, perfectly okay. I mean, he's the baby asking you, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. clearly. Yeah. You said something about his, his, he was transparent and you could see his veins. Yes. yes. And I know Dr. Miriam wanted to say something about that. Oh yes. Um, a lot of times because these babies are born um, way before their normal gestation age, they're born before, um, you find that uh, almost all their systems are not um, mature enough, right from the skin and even what you see internally. No wonder doctors kept being suspicious about the fact that uh, the baby may have uh, a hole in the heart because uh, initially, before that, actually there are certain holes that are supposed to close at about nine months after a baby is born. But now you can imagine this baby was born at 26 weeks Therefore, these holes were still open and to an extent still functional. And then uh, you also find that uh, because of the challenges uh, of the fact that uh, they were born premature, the brain is also not adequately developed, so it's more prone to bleeding. And at the end of the day, this can easily result into some of the complications that we see that uh, we are talking about now. 
So uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is what happened that the baby came out earlier than it should have come out? Did, were you given an, an explanation? Is there a particular reason? Or I was told that my cervix opened. Um, I, and actually, that's why I was able to, to push, to deliver yeah. normally, yes. So um, I, the doctor called it incompetent cervix. Yes, cervix so my, the cervix opened, and so it was too late for them to hold it in. For my next child, he has a follow-up, by the way. For my next child, the doctor told me, as soon as you find out that you're pregnant, you'll come and we stitch. The, they put a stitch to hold the cervix together. So that oh, is, yeah, no. yeah, that's the reason they gave us, the explanation they gave us. Is there a particular cause for, and they said it's a? It's an incompetent Incompetent. Incompetent. Incompetent cervix. Yes. Is there a, a cause? Is there, a, what, what is it? Um, not that I'm aware of. Many mothers actually will discover that they have cervical incompetence with the first or the second um, uh, babies. And um, a lot of times, how well they will discover it is usually like you did um, when they're carrying this um, baby in the womb. As the baby begins to increase in weight, then there's a lot of pressure on the cervical area. And because of that pressure, somehow it gives way and most times then they'll probably lose that baby. But um, at the end of the day, for a few, sometimes it's discovered in time and therefore a stitch is put and then it's held tight by that stitch until maybe 36, 37 or even term and the babies are born normally. Because I think I would, I would be asking myself if there was a thing I did, did I climb trees, did I, you know, you ask yourself all these questions of if it could have been something that you did and if it could reoccur or, or, or something like that. I don't know whether Dr. Halima has something to add about um, cervical incompetence generally. Well, um, there's no clear known cause of cervical incompetence, but what is known is that the mothers who have cervical incompetence will get more recurrent abortions with subsequent pregnancies. So if you're found out to have a cervical incompetence, basically, lose muscles of the cervix, then you won't be able to hold a pregnancy to term. So that means whenever you're pregnant after a few months, if they don't do something, the muscles will still give way. The cervix will open and your baby will come out. But the cause of the, like, the looseness of the muscles is not known, really. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, so another thing, then I wanted to find out, when, so you are in hospital for two and a half months? Yes. Did you have a job, Rina? Yes. Did you then have to say, I, guys, I can't come back to work, or you stay? I had to at some point. Uh, when we were still in hospital, I, I just asked for a semester off, because I, I was a lecturer at the time. I simply asked for a semester off. But when we went back home, I realized, um, I actually attempted to go back to work and realized the baby wasn't you know, developing properly. Um, so one of the biggest challenges really of the preemie mom is the childcare, you know, after hospital. Um, one of the other challenges that I got myself is my milk just refused to come. And like Dr. Uh, Miriam said, one of the things that hadn't developed with our son is his digestive system. So the doctor told us, in no uncertain terms will your son be able to digest formula. Even digesting the breast milk was uh, very difficult because he started out taking just one milliliter, <laughs> one ml. The small spoon of sugar is 2.5 ml, and he was taking just one ml. And even that, they would first watch and see if he's digesting it very properly. At some point, he actually started losing his life. We saw him change color from his feet. Um, I'll just add to it, I think. Uh, what would ordinarily happen is that uh, uh, I would leave work, okay, because the care once you got home is that he had to be fed every two hours throughout the day and throughout the night. But also, as when he got home, also we were required to put him in a heated in room, in a room that had to be heated, had to be humid, like the, incub the like the incubator, as well as uh, uh, keep the room clean all the time. So she had to stay home. So what would happen is that she would be looking after him during the day, then as soon as I got back home from work, I would put my bag down, 
then she will go and rest. Then I'm working the shift after about midnight. <laughs> she wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> she wakes up and then she does a shift after about four. I get up, I yeah, do a shift after about six and I go to work. Then she goes through the day. That's how we, we were go going on for two mm. months in end. Mm. Uh, I feel like there should be extended paternity leave for, <laughs> for men. For I know, even yes. for moms. And going back to the milk, there's a time when he couldn't, he stopped breathing and he, he had gone actually because he had started changing color. And the nurses said he'd gotten an apnea attack and they were trying to wake him up. But the nurse who came in later, what he actually did, what she did was pull out the milk he had taken in. They were using a, a, a syringe to feed him. So when they pulled out the milk, he actually, you know, jumped oh. back to life. So that is how he could, how badly the digestive yeah. system was. And now, I tried, I ate, I drank, I just put on lots of weight and still the milk refused. I pumped until I was sore and still the milk refused. And here's the doctor telling you, your son cannot digest formula. I think, I think for me that was the lowest moment. So um, what was he feeding on? <sighs> yeah. Eventually, uh, what happened is uh, uh, someone from within go to the church where we are serving told us about uh, uh, mothers who can donate milk, breast milk. So that's when we, we heard about that idea for the very first time. So getting more information about it, uh, we spoke to our doctor, uh, the Peter at the time, and we ex expressed to him that option. And he was hesitant, but eventually he said, you know, let's try it. So we, we, we got some volunteer mothers who were actually breastfeeding at that time, who came to the hospital and did some medical tests. And the moment it was okay, they began to supply us milk. So what? So my morning routine would be, I would leave <laughs> home, pass by their home, pick milk that they have, they have, they have uh, frozen, take it to the hospital, because we had to take milk every morning. To have it checked? No, no, no. Oh, the, the moment, was oh she was, the was moment they the passed, hospital. yes. Okay. So the moment the, the doctors were okay with the, with the mothers who had done the tests, so they began to supply us milk every day, every day. So, so we do, there were about three mothers who would actually give us milk, three friends. Yeah. Uh, Yes, of ours, who at the time were actually breastfeeding. So in the morning, I would leave home at about 5.30, pick milk from one of their homes, take it to the hospital. Uh, then in, the, in the evening, one of them would also bring the hospital, and that's how we went through. Because uh, we went the, 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 the milk. milk did not come whatsoever. Remember this, this one night, she actually tried to, to pump milk for the whole night. And uh, I think she woke, I woke up, it was about 5 a.m., and she had tried the whole night, and she only had a little. 13 for, meals. Uh, yeah, 13 meals, and it was rather. Uh, let's take another short break, <laughs> and we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room, and we're talking about uh, preterm babies. Dr. Maria, I wanted to say something about digestion when she was saying they can't. Um, they don't give formula to the preterm babies. Oh yes, um, Peter was talking about um, the fact that uh, he had to run around um, trying to look for breast milk. And uh, to my knowledge, currently there's actually a breast milk bank yes. at uh, Sambia Hospital Zambia. that yeah. has been very helpful in circumstances where mothers are not able to produce enough um, <coughs> breast milk. As you can imagine, I said before that these babies are born with very premature organs and um, one of the organs that tends to be just as affected is the digestive system. So you can imagine this digestive system is more like um, tissue paper and you're trying to pour something onto tissue paper and what happens when you, know, you pour maybe fluid onto it. The digestive systems are extremely, extremely weak, not yet ready to start absorbing or taking in any nutrients from um, from um, by mouth, and uh, because of that, you find that uh, breast milk is probably the best and uh, only um, liquid that could be comfortably taken by babies. Of course, a lot of the formula feeds that are on the market try to mimic a breast milk, but to date, there's no formula that has actually mimicked breast milk to the extent whereby it can actually be taken and there are no consequences. A lot of times when these babies take some of these um, products and uh, formula related feeds, then they end up with uh, complications like um, infections 
that are introduced into their stomachs and uh, as a result just trying to manage these infections can result into mortality. Mm -hmm. oh, Dr. Miriam, do you want to add to that? Um, well, the mom mentioned a very important thing about failure to produce breast milk. This typically happens in so many mothers, especially when they are stressed. Stress is one factor that really suppresses milk production in breastfeeding mothers. So we, we try to encourage them as much as possible to remain calm. We need a lot of support from their husbands and from the rest of the family to ensure that they are less stressed and therefore to have enough stimulation of the milk production center in the brain. That aside, uh, not so many mothers may be lucky to get breast milk donors. And on the other hand, right now there's special formula for preterms on the market. I can't say it's 100% safe, but in cases where the mothers are not able to access breast milk and we don't want to give other feeds, they are better off buying the preterm formula. It's there on the market, though not the best choice, especially when you're having such complications. Mm. But then ideally, the breast milk, even if it is from another m mother, would be safer? Yes. yes. OK. Mm. All right. Um, you were saying, Rina, that you didn't go back to work. Oh, yes. Um, so I'd taken off a semester. <coughs> and um, so we come out of hospital and we sit at home. And one of the things I realized actually about having a preemie mom, a preemie child is once you're out of hospital, for everyone else life goes on. If you're out of hospital, you know, all is well. But then you actually begin another journey of, like he said, we had to get a heated room for him. We had to keep him warm. We had to get a thermometer and keep checking his temperature. We had to feed him every two hours. And we were getting uh, donated milk so it was frozen. So you have to thaw it, heat it, feed him, bath him. By the time you put him to bed, it's time to prepare for the next the feed. Next. And so that kind of care, really, you can't leave it to the house help. And also because hygiene is absolutely important because infections could be fatal, like Dr. Miriam said. But at some point, of course, now the pressure of the bills and all that, I thought to myself it wouldn't be fair on him if I let him handle all the burden himself. So I went back to work. but. I think just a few months into going back to work, not just even just about one month, it's about two weeks back into work, I realized he's not putting on weight, he's not growing, he's not you know, moving, making adjustments. And uh, I find out that the house help I had at the time was diluting the breast milk <laughs> with water. <laughs> And that's why he wasn't, you know, making the, we, we looked for all kinds of help, we tried to get a nurse and different kinds of help. Eventually we made up our minds and said, you know what, I'm going to stay home and I'm going to raise my child until the time when he's out of, you know, danger. And like I shared, we have a support group for moms with preemies and that's their biggest challenge. I need to get back to work, who do I leave my child with? So what you just mentioned, I think it would really be very, very important if workplaces or even government came up with policies where a special child, you know, a mom with a special child of any kind should at least have either elongated leave or some adjustment where you can probably come in a little later or get half pay. Work from home. Or work from home. Different options that really, you know, that could be put in place to help the moms adjust and the dads. And Dr. Miriam said, uh, sorry, Dr. Dr. Halima. Halima talked about support from the husbands. It is very unfortunate that in this day and age, there are a number of men who walk away from their wives because they've had a premature baby. We have seen this not once, not twice. Mm -hmm. This day and age, you are educated <laughs> men. <laughs> <laughs> Believing the fable You, you need to see the website <laughs> <I'm looking at> <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> really believing <laughs> that the ma the woman who has brought you a premature child is is problematic, you know, is cast in some way. And so we actually have heard of men that have abandoned their wives in hospital with these children. There's nothing that a preemie mom at that point needs more than support. Support from their spouses, support from their families. I had incredible support. 
Peter would come from hospital, from work to hospital to do kangaroo care. He would open his shirt and put that baby here and lock him in and rock him until it was time to go back to work. The doctors were looking at him like, uh, so I had really incredible support from him doing the milk runs, doing the feeds. We had to kind of come up with a shift plan. But also my family, my friends, we had such incredible support. So if you know someone who has a premature baby, there's something you can do for them. There's okay. this one lady, I don't even know her name. She called Peter and said, I've heard about what you've been going through. And like he explained, we had to do all the feeds every two hours. In the morning, I would think, okay, the night is over. It's time to take a break. Then I remember, oh, shoot, even during the day, he has to be fed every two hours. So sleep was a thing of the past. And that's, you know what sleep deprivation can do to you. And we had another child. This lady called Peter and said, I've, I've been, I have experienced taking care of such babies with baby Watoto. And she says, I'm going to come over and just take over just for a few days. She was actually able to just give us one night. And she came, took her baby out. We, we got the baby out of the uh, room. She got her center, her serving center, you know, put all the things she needed to clean the bottles, you know, prepare the feed. And she fed her son for the night. And just for that one night, we were able to have uninterrupted sleep. Wow. It, it was like a miracle. So support, absolutely. People take sleep for granted. Okay. I, I, I used to that. take <laughs> sleep for granted. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone sent me a message and said, um, many people giving birth to premature babies and the cost, there are many people giving birth to premature babies and the cost to keeping them alive is unbearable. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Peter says, yeah, yeah. Do you want to expound on that? Well. It Interestingly, uh, two, weeks, uh, two weeks after uh, uh, Karen had been born, we, uh, uh, I think that time we didn't have a realization of how much money that would take. Uh, we were called by the finance team in the hospital. Uh, they needed to have a chat with us, and uh, at that time we got to know that the bill had reached 9 million shillings in two weeks. And so they were asking us to, to at least pay half of the bill because they were concerned as to how uh, that money would come through. And so it, it, it was quite expensive. I, I think by then we left the hospital, we paid about 27 million shillings, but that wow. was because the doctor, the PID, chose of his own account not to get paid. He said, cut off my costs. The costs due to me, I choose to forego that, pay the others, because he, he, he saw what we had gone through. And so we had a lot of concessions that were made, and so we paid 27 million shillings, otherwise it would have been a lot more. And I, and I guess that's where really we just saw the hand of God because then uh, people came alongside us and, and, and contributed. It, w it was just amazing that uh, by, by the time we left, we had no single shilling we owed the hospital. We paid it in full, but uh, it, what it would be quite I expensive. I think what's then shocking me is the, that insurance doesn't cover yeah. Yeah. you when you have a baby before the nine Return. months period. Yes. Because the point of it really is supposed to lessen the burden. We were actually told before nine, nine months, that's a fetus. That's what the, 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 made the insurance people yeah. told us. They told us before nine months, that's a fetus, a viable baby is at nine months plus. And interestingly, as soon as it clocked nine months, everything, well, now we are talking just flu, and a few things were covered by the medical insurance, but before then, nothing was covered. And right now, as we're working with the different moms that are going through the same, the cost is still their biggest still. challenge. Many of them are still in hospital. Many of them would, would like to transfer to cheaper hospitals, but even that, because already they have accumulated a big yes. bill. So you're worried about whether your child will actually make it, and yet you also have to think about the cost. And, and like Dr. Alima says, don't stress. And Dr. So Alima says, don't stress, so you can <laughs> get breast milk. And okay. like Dr. Well, Miriam these are your say, closing remarks. Because of time. Yes, no, please. Like Dr. Miriam said, um, there are not many foundations out there be, uh, that will support anyone going through challenges with premium moms. Mm. We have tried to look for, you know, development partners in health who are doing something that can do something to do with premature babies. And you realize that actually in the first world, healthcare is not as expensive as it is here. So you don't find many foundations that are doing something. So probably we shall start the foundation that will help the mothers. I, I think you should. Peter, your closing remarks? Well, uh, I, I'll just uh, take the direction of, uh, we called our son Natangaza. His name is Natangaza. Natangaza means uh, God amazes. 
because uh, I think that the journey that we saw with what his life went through, I mean, it's just a miracle that, that he yeah. is where he is. And interestingly, uh, of all our children, he's the one who falls sick the least. He's so strong, so energetic, full of life. And so I, I, I okay, I, I think, again, my appeal would be to husbands, support your wives. I, yeah. I tell you what my wife went through. It, it, it would have been very hard for her if she was doing it by herself. And I, I believe that, that, that indeed husbands will need to support our wives even going through that, uh, that, that situation. And trust the Lord, because in, indeed we saw really God's mm -hmm. hand at work even all through this situation. Yeah. Yes. And, and employers, please give these people more paternity leave. <laughs> 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 Dr. Miriam. Um, <coughs> definitely any baby who comes out alive is, is not a fetus. And, and um, if given the right care, even babies of 600 grams can make it okay. into this world and become meaningful citizens. I think there's a lot for us as stakeholders, a lot for the community, a lot for government to do to make sure that uh, we create the kind of infrastructure we train the medical people that are needed and create room for these babies to be brought into this world and grow so that they can go back and actually make the meaning they're meant to. All right, thank you, Dr. Miriam. And Dr. Alima, finally. Yes, um, as we close this, I still want to say prematurity is a very big problem in our community. Uh, they are one lucky couple that maybe they had access to very good care while in hospital. But there are many mothers out there in the communities who can't afford to come to first class hospitals to get the care they need for their preterm babies. So um, we would request government to really prioritize prematurity in our setting because it, it causes a very high mortality in the children under one month of age or okay. even under fives. Then um, training them is one important thing, but we need to motivate them, okay? If you train people and take them up country when you're not motivating them, they will still not do what they are supposed to do. Okay. We need to supervise the health workers at all levels. We need to motivate them. We need to put the right infrastructure. All right. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for coming to the program and sharing your story and also the expertise. Well, that brings us to the end of our show for tonight. Coming up uh, right after this is NTV Weekend Edition with Sandra Twinovudio.